Hey, it's Dr. Jamie, and let me tell you about some amazing beef products that we love in our house. Certified Piedmontese is a healthier beef option that doesn't sacrifice flavor or tenderness. The cattle at Piedmontese are raised responsibly and carefully on family ranches across the Midwest, and they're healthier too. They're never given antibiotics, steroids, or hormones. They raise the rare Piedmontese breed through a ranch-to-fork approach that ensures traceability, environmental sustainability, humane animal handling, and responsible resource management at every step. Countless well-known chefs from across the country rave about the exceptional quality and flavor profile of certified Piedmontese beef. The Certified Piedmontese Program is a source-verified, ranch-to-fork operation that's rooted in dedication to the land, ranchers, cattle, consumers, and products. Progressive ranching protocols such as the electronic identification tagging technology, database tracking initiatives, DNA testing to confirm heritage, and voluntary third-party audits ensure the beef meets the high standards of care, handling, and quality. Certified Piedmontese beef has fewer calories, less fat, and higher protein per ounce than beef from any other breed, making it an ideal source of lean protein for a healthy diet. A serving of certified Piedmontese beef has even fewer calories ounce for ounce than salmon, yet it challenges the prime grade beef products and tenderness. The combination of leanness and tenderness results in a consistently healthy and delicious dining experience for those who will not settle for anything less. And well, you guys, that's me. So go check out Certified Piedmontese. They have a Dr. Fit and Fabulous beef box, or you can order any of their products using my code Dr. Fit. D-R-F-I-T. Thank you, Certified Piedmontese. Welcome to the Fit and Fabulous Podcast with Dr. Jamie Seaman. Hello, everybody. It's Dr. Jamie, and welcome back to the Fit and Fabulous podcast. I'm super excited. I have an incredible guest on today's podcast. Dr. Kevin Stock is a dentist. He's been on a lifelong mission to discover how to bring people the highest levels of health and fitness. Um, He has been on a quest advocating for a meat-based carnivore diet. As a dental student, he started something called Muscle Science, a blog where he shared research and ideas about optimizing fitness. He wanted to practice what he preached. He's used these nutritional strategies and became a national level physique competitor. After he cracked the fitness code, he was discovering a missing piece, his health. His research turned to optimizing not just outer appearance, but also our inner health. He was drawn to a very niche area of dentistry called dental sleep medicine. After he graduated dental school and got advanced training, he opened his practice strictly devoted to treating obstructive sleep apnea and helping people sleep better by breathing better. Dr. Kevin Stock, welcome to the Fit and Fabulous podcast. Oh, thanks for having me, Jamie. I mean, I've seen you all over the place. So, I mean, I've looked forward to talking with you for a long time. So it's an honor. Yeah. Yeah. This is incredible. I have a lot of dentists in my family actually, but no, uh, no other <laughs> MDs. So really, uh, this is, yeah, this is awesome. And of course people on my Instagram now I've, I've been wearing these Invisalign. I, um, am well over halfway into this. What's so funny is I thought this was completely aesthetic when I first started and realized after my assessment, it was, it was not aesthetic. I, I had some issues that needed corrected. I've never had braces in my life, but um, it's, uh, it's been a journey. So, yeah, well, your teeth look great. Well, that's the thing is like my top, most people see my top, but I had a lot of overcrowding on my bottom and a really deep overbite. I've never had breathing or like airway issues, mm-hmm. but I was having some really, um, bad wear on the back of my front teeth for my deep overbite. So that's what we're really trying to correct mostly. So, okay. So let's talk about teeth, but I think your story is interesting, Kevin. Can you talk about just your journey? like going into dental training and what you knew back then. And like, where was this epiphany of like a meat-based carnivore diet? Because I don't think that's typical for most dentists. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's been a, a, a strange journey. It's kind of hard to connect all the dots, but it did start out like, like very early. And I'd say like adolescence, I was an overweight kid and throughout high school and college, really the health journey was really just more a fitness journey. Like I wanted to not be overweight and I wanted to learn how to build muscle, how to lose fat. And I feel like I figured that out in college and then especially into dental school and like why I went to dental school. That's another story. But, uh, so I was in dental school and that's when I, you know, I started doing a couple of physique competitions. And so I figured out, like, I, like I said, like the fitness code, like I, I kind of figured that piece out, but I wasn't feeling good. And I made what I feel is a very common kind of miss 
uh, assumption today, or at least I made the false assumption that like, look, if I got fit, like then health is a natural byproduct. And mm. I do think because we are, we have like an obesity overweight epidemic, when most people do improve body composition, they do tend to get healthier, but just because one, like it's not necessarily a direct, uh, association. Like you can have a decent body composition and not be healthy. Wow. And, you know, I was an example of that. And I really don't have to look very far. Like my own dad is a very good ex example of that. He's a healthy body composition. He's like my height, 5'11", 160 pounds. He golfs like every day, he works out like on the outside, very healthy, but like on the inside, he, he, uh, I mean, he can't eat without taking a pill. He's had gallbladder taken out. He's got kidney stones in the ER, like every three months, it seems like. Uh, and so he's had a, like a host of health issues, high CAC scores, like you name it. And so long story short was, uh, you know, I, I wanted to start bringing the health and fitness. Like we usually see those words in one breath. Uh, but for me, it was like, I found the fitness, but I need to find the health. And that journey led me to you know, I'd done ketogenic diets, but then, you know, I really dove into a ketogenic diet. I got some of the benefits I was looking for mostly with respect to like mental performance, but not all of it, uh, mm. especially in the body composition realm took like a hit when I went full ketogenic, uh, which led me to removing some plant foods. I started like removing oxalates and lectins. And before you know it, you move those two, you start eating mostly only meat. And for the first time in my life, I was eating any significant quantity of red meat because I knew I couldn't just survive on chicken breast. Uh, yeah. And it was pulling those two levers where I started to feel the best I've ever felt. My gym performance got right back to where it was and then some. Uh, and so, I mean, that kind of brings us to where we are today. <laughs> So did you compete? You competed. Uh, I'm just super interested because I competed for the first time last year and I've had, you know, Robert Sykes on the podcast, Keto Savage, who clearly is kind of a pioneer in yeah. ketogenic bodybuilding. So did you compete both before you were carnivore? And then have you competed since being low carb ketogenic? That's funny. I actually talked to Robert yesterday. Uh, he is like a pioneer in the ketogenic bodybuilding space. So my first competition was in dental school. I want to say I was like in my third year of dental school. Uh, and it was not ketogenic. Okay. Uh, it was, I, I would say more traditional bodybuilding, although I don't even know what tra traditional bodybuilders. I mean like chicken anymore. and rice, low fat, but it, a lot carb. of lean, a lot of lean meat. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Uh, and then my next, I, I mean, to back this with up some context, like I never was really interested in doing competitions. Uh, I had started muscle science and talking about the science between like what I was doing to build muscle and lose fat. And I just wanted to practice what I preach. So that's why I did the kind of the competition. Uh, and so that was the first one I did. I did another one after I graduated dental school. I'm going to say, uh, I don't remember the year, maybe 2015, something like that, where it was more heavy meat, but it was still not just like pure ketogenic or anything like that. And since then, I've not had really any interest in doing a bodybuilding competition, but maybe I, I'll do another one someday. But uh, no, I have not done like a ketogenic, strictly bodybuilding competition. Although I've done some experiments over the last six plus years of like mostly eating just meat where, you know, I take pictures and show people like, Oh, this is my body composition, but I haven't, I haven't got on stage. Yeah. I think it's just an interesting thing you broke up or brought up because I think people look at a physique competitor and think that that is like some level of attainment like that is that is health like you said that that's what health looks like and there are some of the most unhealthy people yeah. right we think of unhealthy as like the super morbid obese person but actually right. like there's there's extremes on every end so oh yeah when anyone's getting ready to do a show pretty confident to say they're not feeling their best like that last month going into show prep when they're really dieting down and like i know i felt terrible i was talking to robert yesterday i know he feel you know when he did his original bodybuilding show is like he felt pretty terrible as well yeah. <laughs> so the body yeah. doesn't really want to be that lean <laughs> okay so let's talk about nutrition and its implications for oral health dental health like most dentists i mean aren't really asking people what they're eating but obviously it it plays a role can you talk about that no, they really don't. And like, we're supposed to, and like every little checkbox, you know, you know, did you do your oral hygiene instruction, dietary advice, you know, we're supposed to check that box. Uh, but I think most dentists do it lip service, like, ah, yeah, limit your sugar. And, uh, 
uh, limit snacking. I mean, I think that's probably the best that most dentists will do because uh, there's two things that really are going to most directly impact like decay, at least like teeth decaying. And that is sugar carbohydrate consumption. And then the frequency of sugar carbohydrate consumption. And then of course, oral hygiene, but those are the two things that are, uh, probably the most important when it comes to preventing decay. Like if you want to ensure you don't get decay, like you just don't eat carbohydrates and you pretty much won't have any issues with decay. Cause that's a necessary uh, component for the bacteria to ferment, produce the acid environment that leads to decay. So, uh, it's both, both like that acid attack from carbohydrates, but also the frequency of that. So like the worst thing you can do is like a soda analogy, which is a horrible thing for your teeth. It's better to like just down one soda one time than to like sip on a soda throughout the day. Okay. Uh, but just it's best it. to just not drink the soda at all. <sighs> okay. Fascinating. Um, so let's talk about kids. I've got three kids. Let's talk about when we're born. And I've heard you talk on your social media about development of the jaw, development of the teeth, development of the airway. Talk about things that we do in our society that help or hinder these things. Yeah. So I'm, I mean, the pediatrics is the one area of like dentistry where I've, so there's two areas of dentistry that I've really spe specialized in, spent most of my time in. One is the dental sleep medicine that you mentioned. We can talk about that. That's treat, that's sleep apnea, that's airway health. But the other one is pediatric dentistry. So I still see pediatric dentists. Uh, I mean, I'm st I still see pediatric uh, children uh, on a, on a temporary or part-time basis. And so childhood nutrition is extremely important, both like we talk about like preventing decay, but also like in the development of craniofacial bones and oral posture and the things that lead to proper development of the teeth and the airway. And so what people are kind of shocked to hear is that in most cases, like crowded teeth, impacted teeth, like we think that's like genetics, like, oh, I got, I got my dad's teeth, big teeth in my mom's jaw. And so that's why I have crowded teeth or something like that. But that's just not how it works for most cases. Uh, so like we look at, I've been fascinated with dental, uh, uh, like archaeology, like dental fossils, an anthropology. And we see in the record, like prior to agriculture, like 10,000 years ago, like there was no like decay and crowded teeth. And so really we start seeing decay with the advent of agriculture and there's some malocclusion that sneaks in there in these fossils, but really malocclusion, which is like these crowded teeth and the need for braces. Uh, that's like a modern industrial age within the last 150 to 200 years where we start to see that really take off. So it's not like a normal thing that we have braces. I had braces almost like, I think over half of kids these days are going to at least have braces expected to have braces or need to have braces. And this is a function, I believe, of nutrition, like mostly like what we're eating. And it starts as a child, like, so from infancy, like, is the child being breastfed? That has important implications. Yeah, can you, dive, can you dive into that? Because I think that would be interesting for people. Yeah, like so bottle, like a bottle fed formula baby versus a breastfed baby. Yeah, so a bottle feeding is very much uh, more passive. So what you can just tilt the bottle, milk's going to come out baby can drink it. Whereas breastfeeding is much more active from, for the baby, where they basically have to push their tongue to the roof of the mouth, which is what we want them to start training to do that. Uh, so actively engaging those muscles, working those muscles to get the nutrition. Uh, and so then we talk about the nutrition, like if it's a bottle, uh, ideal is like a breastfed baby. Second ideal would be a bottle fed, but with breast milk and then far inferior is bottle fed with formula, uh, because of the, the, the nutrition differences. And so as an infant breastfeeding is very important, both for, from muscular as well as a nutrition standpoint. And then the food we wean onto then is critically important. Most kids are going to wean onto mush, both poor nutrition, and they're not going to be working their jaws to learn how to chew. And a lot of the evidence supports the malocclusion. And I have, I look in the mirror or the camera right now, and I see all of the, the bad things that I'm about to mention, but like inadequate growth of the lower jaw. Uh, okay. That, that's the mandible. Uh, and that is strongly associated with poor nutrition as well as we're not working those muscles. So we, we wean onto mush. We're not chewing like we should. The baby needs to be chewing on tough food to stimulate the growth of, of growth of the jaw. And if we don't stimulate the growth of the jaw, then we get wisdom teeth that have to be extracted. Mine were taken out when I was 12 years old. And we start to, we see what happens 
when we do the wrong things, like too much, like the worst case scenario, like bottle fed formula, lean onto child food, food mush. Uh, so these muscles aren't getting worked. We're not getting ideal nutrition. You start getting a long face, mouth breathing, uh, and the need you'll have narrow dental arches. So the teeth won't, the, the, there's not room for the teeth to come in. So we got to take the wisdom teeth out. Uh, and like I said, least mouth breathing is a big part of this as well. So we should be at rest mouth shut teeth, lightly touching tongue to the roof of the mouth. But most kids, you look around anywhere today, mouth is open tongues at the bottom, breathing through their mouth. Uh, and yeah, so that that's a little from the standpoint of malocclusion and a lot of our oral issues, uh, stem from early childhood, poor nutrition. Yeah. It's so, it's so interesting to me as a mother, because I came into this space, like after my kids were already born. And I mean, you guys, I'm an OBGYN and I was like the worst patient at pregnant patient, <laughs> like drinking Sonic half price milkshakes at 8 PM. Um, is there something, uh, if a mom can't breastfeed, let's say, and you said kind of second best, obviously pumping, giving the baby breast milk or bottle, but we see as moms, there's like 9,000 different bottles like at the store. And then like, as they become kids, there's all these different utensils and sippy cups and things like that. Is there, is there something that's better in, in that world of, of stuff? Or is it all just kind of the same? There are some brands I know, like Dr. Brown's, I, th I think it's Dr. Brown's, uh, where it does require a more active participation from the child uh, versus like the sippy cup where it's just going to kind of sp spill out. I think what, one of the most important things is when starting to wean a child onto real food, six months or so, you start introducing these foods. I am a big advocate, you know, you watch them, but you start giving them some red meat and watch them chew on it. You can start with liver, which is easier to chew. Uh, mince and, it? Like what is the safest way? I mean, obviously you don't cut, want to cut it. Just enough. cutting up in small pieces, I think is a way to go. It's going to make the baby still have to work uh, relatively safe. Uh, and that at least gets them into the habit of using these muscles as well, the nutrition for one, but two, then using these muscles to use to like, to chewing more yeah. or less so that they can keep their mouth shut so it can fight against gravity. And so they're not mouth breathing from an early age, which is in my opinion, pretty catastrophic, the, the sequela of issues. Yeah. I remember as a mom thinking my kid had to have teeth to eat meat. Um, but I remember our doctor, she was like, no, give, give them some meat, you know, you know, mush it up a little bit. Like you can kind of like tenderize it, you know, soften it. She's like, they can chew it with their jaw. And I was like, Wait, what? cause my kid didn't get, we didn't get teeth. Our kids didn't get teeth, which was great for breastfeeding until they were, you know, I don't even remember, but it was like late. Like I remember they're seven, eight months, months yeah. seven, eight months old and they had no teeth. And I'm like, how are they going to eat? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's true. It actually is pretty impressive, especially like edentulous older patients as well. Like you think that like they can do amazing things with those gums. Like, yeah, they, I've seen some eat corn on the cob. I wouldn't recommend that, but it's like, uh, yeah, you don't necessarily need to have your teeth to uh, chew on the meat. Yeah. It's like, it's just a little extra accessory. You touched on wisdom teeth for a second. Um, I feel like it's just something like where you get to a certain age and then you get your wisdom teeth out. Like what's the deal with that? Isn't it crazy? Uh, I talk about like an analogy where it's, I, what's, what's crazy to me is like the normalization of some of this pathology where it's like, ah, you gotta get, like, I, I pull teeth out of kids' mouths like every day. And it's like, this is just a, just a normal, like, this is what's supposed to happen. But really it's like, this is not normal pathology. It, sh it shouldn't be happening. But with regard to the wisdom teeth, it is so much just expected. Like I was 12 years old, like that's pretty young. And the, they had to go in, my, they were impacted, caused me pain. They went and take, took them out. Uh, refer like back to like the fossil record wisdom teeth basically always came in uh hunter gatherer populations prior to uh agriculture so from a genetic standpoint we should like be able to accommodate all our teeth we're like the only animals that all our teeth don't fit into our mouths so and this is i mean most of the evidence suggests it has to do with the chewing like we've moved on to mush i do think like 
that it's kind of like a muscle. I, I think about it like training a muscle to train a muscle. You need really two things when you need the nutrition and then you need the workout. If you only have the nutrition, you're eating perfect, but you don't ever work out that muscle is not going to grow. And if you're working out like really like hardcore, but you don't have the nutrition muscles, not going to grow optimally. But when it comes to the, the growing the jaw, we do need these two, these two stimulus, we need the proper nutrition, we need to, uh, we need to work it out. So we need to be chewing, we need to be, I would, you know, say chewing a lot of animal based foods, uh, to get the jaw growth to be able to accommodate all the teeth. But that is, I guess, more of a rarity every year that passes, because, you know, more and more people need to cannot do not have the space for those wisdom teeth. So I don't, I don't specifically know the answer to this, but why are they called wisdom teeth? Cause mine started to come in in medical school. And so I'll pretend that that's why. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I thought I was real smart at 12 years old. I was like, Oh, I already got these wisdom teeth. Uh, we, they're technically called third molars. And like, that's what, you know, I learned in dental school to call them third molars, but wisdom teeth is just the colloquial term. I have no idea why they're called that besides that they come in like typically 18 years old, like when you're yeah. coming of age, coming of wisdom. Yeah. Interesting. So fascinating. Okay. Another common question, pediatric dental world. What's the story with fluoride? Yeah. Fluoride's a big rabbit hole because it's, I, I should say it's very controversial because I have the pediatric dentistry I do is kind of unique. It, I work for this company called Smile America Partners and they send me around Missouri but I'm in St. Louis, Missouri, but they'll send me around Missouri to kind of underserved areas, rural areas in Missouri, where there's not a dentist and a, mostly Medicaid patients and different counties. Some counties have fluoridated water, some don't. And mm -hmm. so there's all this controversy, like, does, does it work? I can tell you from like my own epidemiological assessment, like I can definitely tell a difference from counties where there's fluoridated water versus unfluoridated water, both being like, low socioeconomic Medicaid populations, a lot of the confounders being eliminated. Uh, I do see a difference. So uh, I do think fluoride does work. <laughs> Some people will argue that. So I actually do think it does help prevent decay to an extent. Uh, I do think the controversy comes, we are, because they're putting the fluoride in our water, our drinking water. So we are systemically taking in this mineral in doses that may not be physiological and I think are associated with adverse health outcomes, especially like neurologic, like we see like drops in IQ in studies. Uh, so to me, I am personally against fluoridating water for the sake of preserving primary teeth, baby teeth, uh, but topical fluoride application and using fluoride in toothpaste where, you know, to help strengthen teeth and you spit it out, you're not swallowing it. I am more, I'll say mainstream there, because I see how it has, like can help prevent cavities. Uh, but like I have a Berkey water filter, I filter the fluoride out of my water. Um, so I guess the short answer is, I do think like it works to varying degrees, can help prevent decay. I would prefer not to have it. I would, of course, like my number one recommendation is eat a diet that doesn't cause decay. And then like, you don't, this is like becomes a non-issue, but in the populations I see where diets are definitely not a, ideal, I'm like, well, I prefer not to have fluoride in my water for the, the systemic adverse mm -hmm. health issues, uh, but some topical application, whether through toothpaste and not swallowing and spitting it out and whatever. I do, I do see there is like, potential benefits, like, like anything, there's like pros and cons. And so I do see like the pros of like, if you're not swallowing it, you're not taking in too much systemically and it can help prevent decay and help keep your baby teeth, which is important to growing your face properly. Uh, that's good. But there's also downsides where of ingesting it on a continuous basis, you know, day after day, month after month, year after year, decade after decade, where I do think it can have, uh, some adverse health consequences. Yeah. Yeah. That's okay. People think birth control pills are evil and I prescribe them. So <laughs> yeah, there's, I mean, you there's know like, I nice. mean, there are some applications of Western medicine at a population level that we have to acknowledge. Yeah. And it's nice to know, like one thing, like I, I'm sure you're always telling patients, like any kind of intervention, like there's pros that we're trying to like, and then there's also cons there's risk and mm -hmm. benefits that we have to assess. Uh, mm -hmm. So I'm asked that a lot with regard to you know, root canals is a good example. And I'm like, okay, if you don't want a root canal, but you have to, you have to think about what, do you want to leave a space 
in your mouth because that actually has consequences as well. But if you want to replace it with an implant or with a bridge, like there's other, there's these other treatment modalities, but they also have their, you know, their pros and cons, their risk and benefits. So. Yeah. Okay. So when it comes to um, fluoride toothpaste, you, you kind of said for some people, it's probably a good thing. What about these other toothpaste I've seen recently, like this hydroxyapatite toothpaste? Hydroxyapatite. Right there. Yeah. So I was, fluoride is the one that just has, has kind of like the most research and most, most toothpaste uh, like main brands are fluoride based, but there are other ingredients that are similar, like hydroxyapatite, like you mentioned, is one that I would say, if you want something that's going to help strengthen your teeth and that's not fluoride, I would go to hydroxyapatite. Uh, okay, cool. Cause I started using it. <laughs> yeah. I, I think it's a great option. I, I think it's a great option. There's n- not nearly as much research about it. I, I was, I mean, I talk about this a lot, obviously, but (laughs) you get to a point where like, really, if you are eating like a good diet, and I know that's not perfect, not not possible maybe for everyone, but like toothpaste becomes superfluous. Like you really don't need, need it. And it's kind of weird. I I haven't feel weird as a dentist saying that, but it's like, we shouldn't need toothpaste. Like, and for a lot of people that are eating like very good diets. I'm like, if you want to brush your teeth, like you just use water, soft toothbrush. I like an electric toothbrush. Like that's really more all you need uh, Mm -hmm. in reality. Yeah, no, it totally makes sense. I mean, at some point in our lifetime, we didn't have basic toothbrushes. Yeah. And it wasn't in that distant of the past, whereas like the invention, really the invention of dentistry is not that far back in history. Uh, You know, it was in the 19th century when like we, I think the first, the first dental school in the United States, I'm trying to think of 1890 or something like that in Baltimore. So it's like in the, in the realm of history, it's pretty recent. Like we even had this profession of dentist, nonetheless, you know, toothbrushes and toothpaste and implants and all this other stuff. So, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Let's stay on this for just a second. Then, um, the oral microbiome, like microbiome is kind of this new hot thing in all areas of medicine, obviously oral microbiome, um, is in the mouth for people listening. (laughs) Talk to me about mouthwashes and like tongue scraping what are things obviously you said eat the right diet and you probably don't need to do anything but like talk about some of these other interventions i think some of the inter- other interventions it's worth talking about because they can cause more harm than good and like mouthwash i think is a prime example because we tend to have this perception that like bacteria is bad okay so let's sterilize the mouth with the mouthwash some antibacterial mouth rinse right but like you said, there's, a, there's an oral microbiome. It is important. We actually need these bacteria. There's like, so we talk about good and bad bacteria. That's fine. Bacteria are basically going to live in like, we want them to live in a homeostatic balance. And what happens, what, what bad bacteria is like streptococcus mutants, which plays a big role in decay. Okay. It's in a healthy mouth. It's in an unhealthy mouth. What's, what happens is like that gets out of balance. And so you got all these cavity promoting bacteria, but we don't want to just kill off all bacteria because there's bacteria in the mouth play a very important role in producing nitric oxide. And nitric oxide is very important vasodilator for oxygenation of, of the lungs uh, to improve that just in vascular health in general. Uh, so like we, there's research is very, very interesting where they use uh, anti antibacterial mouth rinse and shows increase in blood pressure. And the assumed mechanism is we have these bacteria that are producing nitric oxide, causing vasodilation, which helps with maintaining good blood pressure. You get rid of those bacteria and then we see these people with elevated blood pressure. So I, I think the kind of the moral story when it comes to oral biome is like, hey, we have these bacteria. They're not just bad, like <laughs> that we need them. So the goal is not just to kill them all off. Uh, and so I don't recommend like strong mouth rinses that are trying to be create a septic environment in your mouth uh, or antiseptic environment in your mouth. Uh, rather (laughs) really diet plays a big role in like creating the community of bacteria that is going to facilitate health and not detriment. And so you mentioned like tongue scraping, not something I do. And, uh, I think some people would go to that because of halitosis or bad breath. And that is most likely a dysbiosis, which can stem from the gut. So this is like more of this bacterial imbalance, which to me, like diet is the number one thing to look at if that's an issue. Um, what about people that do like coconut oil swishing or something like that? Oil pulling, like, like oil pulling. Yeah. I look deep into oil pulling. Cause I get questions a lot, a lot about it a lot. And I, you know, I've so I've experimented with it. The research is 
very muddy, like very unclear. So anything, but on the flip side, I've sure heard lots of like anecdotes from people who like swear by it. So I don't just dismiss that, but I, but if I to balance the two, uh, I kind of like, well, if it's something you're interested in trying, you can, uh, a few things I would try, uh, what I would recommend is doing like coconut oil over some of the other, I, I think in Indian culture, they used sesame oil a lot. I would not do that. I would st stick to like a higher saturated fat, like coconut oil. Coconut oil is a good one because it's high in saturated fat, but uh, it tends to be like medium chain, high in con high concentration, medium chain, which makes it viscous enough to be able to like pull it through your teeth. And so that's mm -hmm. what the oil, oil pulling is like. You take some coconut oil, you, s you pull it, swish it through your teeth, uh, and there's all kinds of claims of, you know, it's going to help remove toxins and X, Y, Z. I, like I said, the evidence for that and like the literature is, I'll, I'll say weak, <laughs> but there's plenty of stories you can hear that are, you know, that'll convince you to give it a try. I don't do it routinely. Okay. We tell people to put coconut oil in their vagina, so it's all good. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, okay. So we talked about that. Are there, you know, people take probiotics, prebiotics, forget dysbiosis. Is there any sort of anything in new hot area of dentistry with like mouthwashes that are like probiotic or prebiotic? None that I recommend people to take. Uh, Still too early. Yeah. I, I, nothing that I think is like, yeah, this is definitely something we should try <laughs> to fix the dysbiosis. Usually uh, I feel a lot of the issue, I mean, there's lots of different kinds of gut issues, but one is like stomach acid not being acidic enough. And so we get poor digestion, you get indigestion, we get dysbiosis, then you start getting things like SIBO and uh, mm -hmm. uh, this, this whole digestive tract from the mouth to the anus is like, I tell people that you think of that as a tube. And so really like that tube, it goes through your body, but really that's still the outside of your body. And so we want to keep that functioning well, because that determines what actually makes it in. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so like if you have a stomach acid, that's not acidic enough, uh, maybe things are not being broken down as much as they should. And then further down they're getting in, they're causing gut issues. So uh, those are a few of the things I'm thinking about, but prebiotics, probiotics, nothing uh, that I, I, I'm actually kind of like, I would say on the other side of that, like I have a low, no fiber diet personally. And I know that sounds crazy, but because fiber is like the prebiotic, prebiotic, right. like, right. <laughs> like that's what it is, but I don't personally eat much of any fiber. So. Yeah. Yeah. Do you do any fermented vegetables or anything like that? Or like mostly straight carnivore? I don't do any fermented vegetables for the most part. And just recently, actually, I tried uh, kefir for like the first time and it was fine. I didn't have any digestive problems, but uh, so yeah, I guess the short answer is no. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, okay. Let's talk about airway. Your, your niche area, obstructive sleep apnea, huge problem, huge problem. Huge. Talk to people about what it is and why the airway is so important. Yeah. The, so the gist of it is obstructive sleep apnea, you go to sleep and we breathe through this little tube they call the trachea and that trachea gets obstructed. And so then we stop breathing at night. That's called an apnea. And that happens for a severe sleep apnea person over 30 times an hour for, for a moderate sleep apnea patient, 15 to 30, and then mild is like five to 15. Uh, but this is extremely common. I think it's probably the most undiagnosed serious medical condition in the Western world. Uh, I had a post recently that I was talking about non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. And I think it's estimated like 20, 25% of us adults have non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. And that term NAFLD <laughs> was coined in like the 1980s. Like that's like a new, it's like this new disease popped up where like, we got to put a name on it. And I was talking, I was like, I think like we could talk about fatty tongue and like, because what we see is someone that overweight, obese, we start depositing excess fat in our tongue. And kind of what we were talking about earlier is we already have these mouths that are narrower and smaller than they should be because of a poor diet. And then we throw a fat tongue in there and we get the situation, the mouth is only so big. So we have now this, we shrunk, the, we shrank the mouth more or less, and we throw a fat tongue in there. And the only place you can go is back to obstruct the airway. And so roughly 20 plus percent of US adults now have obstructive sleep apnea, which to me is really, we think about what's actually happening, pretty frightening. Like you literally stop breathing on a repeated basis throughout the night. 
And so what happens is the body doesn't want to just let itself die while you're unconscious sleeping. So there's these micro, micro arousals that happen all night long where you fall asleep, the airway shuts down, you stop breathing, the body does a micro arousal, basically shoots nor adrenaline, norepinephrine to kind of wake you up. And a lot of times it's not conscious. So it's like a arousal, the, the sleeper might, you'll hear a snort a lot of times, like, and then it'll happen again. And so that happens all night long. Understandably, they don't get deep sleep. They don't get REM sleep. They feel terrible. It's catastrophic on heart health, brain health, uh, just overall health. Cause you don't have any energy during the day anymore. So your hormones are just, just whacked. Um, and so that's, that's the gist of it. And as a dentist, the reason I got pulled into it out of dental school was this became aware to me, like how huge of an issue this is. And the gold standard treatment are, is this machine called PAP, positive air pressure, most commonly CPAP, but there's also auto PAP and BiPAP, uh, which basically they're pumping air through the airway to keep it open while you sleep, which is crazy. Uh, but it works if people can wear it. And like the research that I got into is like over 50% of people can't even tolerate this machine, which makes sense. It's just pumping air through your throat while you're trying to sleep. Uh, and like dentists kind of had this novel solution where they create these custom devices that hold the jaw in a position like you're taught in like CPR, you know, pull the jaw forward to open the airway. Uh, so it stabilizes the jaw when, when someone sleeps and it helps treat sleep apnea. So that's what I got into. And, uh, that, you know, that's kind of been a niche area of dentistry that I focused on that took me down another rabbit hole. We could talk about it if you like to, where because of the limitations of oral devices, I developed a device called the Ned device, which is a nasal EPAP device, <laughs> uh, to help treat sleep apnea as well. Yeah, no, tell us about it. I'm fascinated because I mean, I mean, that's the goal. end goal is nasal breathing for even people who don't have obstructive sleep apnea, right? We, we're supposed yes. to breathe through our nose. Yeah, we should be. So the mouth should be shut. We should be breathing through our nose at the night, throughout the night. And I knew as a dentist treating sleep apnea, my patients get better outcomes if they're nasal breathing. So that's number one. So I put these oral devices in their mouths. I move the jaw forward and there's a couple of frustrations. Well, first of all, I should preface it. Sometimes it just works great home run out of the gate, but too often it was like, okay, we took your apnea. Like AHI is how we, we classify severity. Like I was talking 30 times an hour is severe. That's apnea, hypopnea index. We don't need to get into the too much details unless you want to, but someone I'd have an AHI of 30 and I'd make them an oral device. We'd find their best position and they would get them down to like let's just say a 12, an AHI of 12. So there's still like moderate apnea. And I was like, well, that's a lot better than 30, 40, whatever they were, but it's like not all the way there. And the standard then is saying, okay, we did as good as we could do. So that's like, that's what you're going to get. And that never sat well with me. The other option was like, well, we can also strap you up to a CPAP. And I'm like, well, the whole reason they saw me in the first place was because they couldn't tolerate this PAP machine. And so I, it got me thinking like, well, what can I do to like, further improve this treatment. So Ned devices, this idea I had, I was basically, it's basically a nasal dilator to help facilitate nasal breathing. So I was like, that will help number one. And number two, inside the nasal dilator is this thing called EPAP, which is expiratory positive air pressure. So basically when someone breathes out their nose, it creates resistance and the resistance helps keep the airway from collapsing. So PAP is what the CPAP uses, but that's continuous positive airway pressure. This is the same mechanism of action, but it uses your own exhalation breath to uh, accomplish that. So it's basically combining dilator with EPAP for a patient. And my idea originally was like, I want to use this with my patients to get all the, basically all the treatment benefits. Uh, it has been a long process of development. Uh, I was very naive when it came into like medical device development. Uh, I would probably still am quite naive in that realm. So we're, we're still going through like FDA approval for apnea whether we actually see that to the end is still to be determined because right now we're just using it at, to treat snoring where it's a class two medical device. So I don't need to get FDA approval and mm -hmm. it makes it a much lower cost and barrier of entry for a patient to get. So right now it's just, we're using it for snoring, but that's kind of the, the journey in the dental sleep medicine realm. So one thing I started doing was mouth taping. Um, is this a good idea? I think it's a good idea in terms of training oneself to breathe through their nose. I'm always cautious because a lot, because of the prevalence of obstructive sleep apnea, mm -hmm. especially people, they don't think they have it. They're like, oh, I sleep fine, obviously. And a, a surprising amount of people have apnea. So 
I, like I say, I don't like mouth, mouth taping if it's masking the problem because that could make a situation even worse potentially. So if, as long as someone doesn't have obstruction, airway obstruction, mouth taping to train themselves to be a nasal breather at night is fine. But I, th I do like to think of it as kind of like training wheels. So as someone is working on, oh, I'm working on closing my mouth throughout the day, I'm working on having the proper tongue pressure on the roof of the mouth. It, it feels for people that have been mouth breathers and sit with their mouth open all day, it feels like almost like you're training, you have to train this. Uh, and so while you train that mouth taping at night can help train the sleeping part of that. Yeah, I started with um, these little tabs that had like a slit because I had this complex, like it was like a claustrophobia thing. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> for sure. Thing. And so that was just like a nice little crutch. But I'll be honest, like, I mean, I think most of the time I do breathe through my nose, at least like when I wake up, that's like my sense, like I don't have like a dry mouth or dry mouth, you know, yeah. drool down my face. Yeah. Um, but occasionally when I have been woken up multiple nights in a row delivering babies or, you know, whatever it is, like I have this little routine that I do to like guarantee that I'm going to get some like really deep sleep. And one of those things is, is mouth taping. Um, but I obviously don't have other airway issues. So I feel like it's like a safe thing, but I've always wondered about my kids. Like every once in a while, I'll watch my kids and they're, you know, I'm like, Oh God, like, how do I, <laughs> how do I fix that? You know, you I, I hear yeah. you. My girlfriend has a 10 year old son. And I mean, I see all the signs like and I do the best so I can sympathize with the parents struggles because he's eating with his mouth open, always chewing with his mouth open, which is like a pet peeve of mine. So I'm always on top of that one. Uh, but then he's like playing his eye on his iPad mouth is hanging open. I see him sleeping and this is like a cardinal sign. Their neck is extended back. So they've yeah. extended neck mouth open. And that, that's a t standard move to try and open the airway. Mm. Uh, and then he also tends to snore. I'm like, these are all the classic signs of a restricted airway uh, and not having good oral posture. Maybe like we need to start really focusing on proper oral posture and nose breathing and maybe get some more meat in the diet. So, yeah. 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 Yeah, I've diagnosed this in pregnancy even, uh, and it's a big deal. It increases the risk of preeclampsia, all the complications of pregnancy too, because you take somebody that's already got issues and put a giant pregnant fetus in their uterus with fluid, and it's it's bad news. It's bad news. Okay, so let's get back to the animal-based diet for a minute. Um, I mean, obviously, I think we all agree, ultra-processed foods, sugar, bad for the teeth. But let's talk about like the exclusion of, of, of plants? Like, is there, is there something about animal foods that are better for our mouths, for our jaws, for our teeth? Is it something about the nutrients or is it really just preference for you? Uh, I think probably both. So the one is the first one, <laughs> I got, I, this is a, I come at this from a lot of different angles. One is a lot of the plant-based foods these days are you're not like, I, I don't see people eating tons of celery, right? Right. So a lot of the plant-based foods are processed in some way. And first of all, processing is, it's not like, is it processed? It's like how and to what degree, because mm -hmm. like even meat is pro like it goes to a processing, plant. right? Meat process. So like, so like almost everything is processed to some degree. Now meat, the reason I, I'm a big advocate for it is one is the nutrition. This includes everything from like the amino acid profile to the fat soluble vitamins, the kinds of fat it's low in polyunsaturated fat for the most part. We can talk more about that, but, uh, I'm, I think that is maybe the most underappreciated aspect of nutrition these days related to obesity, at least, uh, but the right kinds of fat, fat soluble vitamins, it it's tough enough to make you work your jaw. Uh, so in that regard, it's really important. And then when it comes to you, plants or plant-based foods, I, it really depends on what we're talking about when it comes to oral health. I, I mean, when it comes to oral health versus where it comes to obesity, where it comes to someone's goals, X, Y, Z, because there's definitely certain plant-based foods that are way better than others. So like, it's not like, Hey, let's, uh, like in general, someone that's, <laughs> there's so many caveats, but like, if we took like a healthy person, metabolically healthy, it's like, yeah, fruit can probably be a good part of your diet, you know, some kind of fruit, like, but for 
most people who <laughs> have some kind of metabolic dysfunction, pre-diabetes, diabetes, overweight, obese, I do think limiting fruit is probably not a bad strategy. Uh, I feel like the same way about like tubers, uh, like sweet potatoes, potatoes. I feel like those could be a part of someone's diet. I, I would peel on my, there's some caveats cause I'm a, you know, <laughs> but, but for the most part, those could be fine. But someone with that's, you know, insulin resistant, I'm like, you probably don't need starches. Like let's, we should, oh, I'd probably fix that. And then I think about like various, like the leaves, <laughs> like, like, uh, you know, lettuce, it's kind of, there's not a ton of nutrition in lettuce. So, I mean, it's almost to eat it and I feel fine with it. That's totally fine. I, I don't. And usually what I see happen with a lot of people is like, okay, I'm gonna eat a salad because that's healthy. Right. So they got the lettuce, they got whatever I, I, I would classify as fairly like not super nutrient dense greens that maybe they think is nutrient dense. Uh, and then they top it off with tons of vegetable oil. I'm like, I think you just turned like a, a nutrient kind of like not great meal into like a bad meal. <laughs> uh, and so that's, I mean, and then we go, I, I think of this in wrong. So kind of start with like roots and fruits to me is like, okay, there's like sort of actual nutrition, in these plant-based foods, but they're higher in carbohydrates. So maybe not the best situation for someone who's like a type two diabetic overweight or obese. The next wrong is like leaves, stems. Like these are kind of classic healthy vegetables, but I look at the nutrition. It's like not super nutrient dense. Usually if you're going to eat them, you're going to combine it with something that's not great. So I could take it or leave it. Uh, then like the wrong up is like the seeds of plants. So this is the grains, the nuts, the beans. And I do think most people would be just best off not eating these uh, from a health perspective. And the final kind of wrong I think of is like the top rung. And that would be like the real processed versions of these, like sugar, that's from a plant mostly. Like most people that are eating sugar, they're not eating, it's mostly not lactose. That's the animal sugar. Uh, but most of it is gonna be from like, uh, you know, uh, from plant st stock, like sugar cane, sugar cane or beets, uh, beet roots. Uh, so sugar is plant, uh, vegetable oils, seed oils, like they're just more highly refined plant parts. And those I just really think are like the worst. <laughs> yeah. When it comes to alternative sweeteners, is there anything that's good, better, better for the mouth? For the mouth? That's a good question. Like if you're not going to have sugar, like as far as, yeah. Or do we know? Um, there's... I'm not a super big advocate for any kind of like artificial sweeteners. And part of me is like, you're better off just like going with like raw honey to me is like the best option. If someone had to choose something now, it's not the best option for like oral health. Like you're going to have a tablespoon of honey, like every hour. That's it. I wouldn't do that. But if you're just wanting to like, like, okay, I need some sugar once a day, whatever, like that's probably what I would go towards. I think stevia okay, well, is a fine say, option. Let's say you took like a, big old tablespoon of raw honey. Like, should you swish around with some water and like, cause you talked about like time of exposure. Like, is it, is it better yeah, if you like I, rinse or like eat it with other food or. Like drinking water, rinsing it at is a good s solution. There's always kinds of like, some people are like, Oh, I brush my teeth right after I'm like, well, you actually just create an acidic environment in your mouth. And then you go brush your teeth. That can actually be bad for your enamel and make things like worse. So like, I think water is probably one of the best things you could do to kind of limit the damage there. Uh, but like if people that do want to avoid like the sugar and the calories, I think stevia, monk fruit, allulose, like there's some other options that are okay. Uh, that I would probably go to. Yeah. Yeah. And for people that don't understand how sugar breaks down the mucosal barrier in the mouth, I was talking to a company that is doing a supplement line and it's all these like sublingual type supplements. And they literally put some sugar in there to break down the mucosal barrier so that you absorb the supplement better. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, oh my God. Isn't that crazy? Yeah. 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 So fascinating. So fascinating. I know okay. I, not my area of exp expertise, but related to that is some pharmaceuticals, they lace with, I'm going to, I'm going to forget it, but it, it is a compound from plants that is common. And it's because it causes some intestinal permeability and increases the uptake yeah. of, of the drugs. I'm like, yeah, think, just think about that. Yeah. Yes. I operate as I believe. Uh, yeah. Yes. 
So they'll exactly. say like, oh, it's that like curcumin with bioferine or whatever, but it's a, it's from black pepper and it basically yes. breaks down the intestinal barrier so that you absorb the stuff better. The drug. Yeah. 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 Crazy. <laughs> well, I was joking. I um, was on, um, I mean, I'm pretty professional on social media, but you know, people get so caught up from both sides of it, vegans, carnivores, you know, whatever. But, um, there was recently a, uh, I'll get, the, I don't know the story wrong, I'll get it wrong. In Washington, a, a senator legislator or something whose wife just died. And like the autopsy showed she had a white mulberry leaf in her stomach. Mm. And, uh, somebody was sharing this and I was like, they were basically saying like, you gotta be careful with supplements, you know, and these things. And I was like, oh, so, so plants really are toxic. <laughs> now we're, <laughs> now we're green. <laughs> I mean, it's, I mean, they are, when you think about it, like medicinally, like we use plant medicines. I mean, literally like, um, I mean, there's plants that are poisonous. I mean, they're not all, they're not all good. So I'm with you on that one, but I always, I always feel like sometimes we get into like so much dogma in, uh, in social media sometimes, like, yeah. Um, okay. All right. So we, we end all the podcasts with the semen analysis. So I pulled this super interesting study. I'm always following the research with the oral microbiome and pregnancy outcomes because of the population I deal with. And I always tell pregnant patients, you know, that the, the, the oral hygiene and take care of their teeth, like we know it's associated with pregnancy outcomes. So there was a study that recently came out that like made headline news all over, I don't know, good morning, America that chewing sugar-free gum basically reduces your risk of preterm birth. This is like what the headlines were reading. Um, so they were looking at this sugar-free gum. Um, it was a large study actually done in Malawi. So it wasn't done in the United States. It wasn't done on the United States population. But basically, um, I've, like I've said, poor oral health associated with preterm birth, but this gum actually contained xylitol, um, which is a sweetener that comes from plant, I believe birch trees. Does that sound right to you? That's and um, they've lo- it's all over dentistry, xylitol, like lollipops and lots of different xylitol interventions in, um, in the oral, oral world. So they basically gave these women xylitol gum. Um, there was 549 out of 4,349 pregnancies that ended up being preterm, so 12.6%. And this was all presented recently at the S- Society for Maternal Fetal Medicine. And there was a 24% reduction and the people that were given the xylitol gum compared to the women who were not. And um, which is pretty incredible. I mean, that's a pretty significant reduction. And preterm birth is not just a problem in Malawi. It's a huge problem here in the United States too. Um, but they enrolled almost 10,000 women across eight different centers across Malawi um, to conduct this study. And they had done some cultural um, kind of reconnaissance a little bit too, like asking the Malawian people, like, what do you think are some of the major problems in your country? And these women in their own language were describing basically like babies born too early. So this was like a decade long project that they did. Um, And there is basically definitely a link between periodontal disease and preterm birth. And um, so, you know, we've kind of touched on that here. You know, people who have periodontal disease, not only have preterm birth, they have heart disease, they have, I mean, all sorts of, of, of chronic diseases. Um, but they just basically believe that this xylitol intervention changes the diversity and size of the microbial community within the mouth, which probably impacts the gut because your mouth is connected to your gut. And the shift basically, um, and, and it reaches the bloodstream. So like this bacteria in your mouth can, as you brush your teeth, it goes into the bloodstream and probably the placenta. So they're kind of maybe theorizing that it's just enough of an intervention that it, that it reduces basically like inflammation that's sent down to the placenta. Do you have any thoughts about xylitol, uh, Dr. Sack? I think it's super interesting because there's two sides to the argument with xylitol because of its antibacterial effect, both kind of like we talked about a little bit earlier, where it's like, well, if you do have a problem where you have too much of, we'll just say the bad bacteria, and it's going to help, uh, it's going to help those, uh, kill off more balance, those bad bacteria out, then it can be a good thing, but in a, in a healthy mouth, if it is, I, how should I say, like impeding some of the good bacteria, maybe not the best thing. Uh, so there's, there's like, don't like fix it if it's not broke. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah. but it definitely is linked with like reduced caries because of it, that it's effect on strep mutants, I believe it is. Uh, so that, I mean, it's a fascinating study. Uh, one thing that to mention, like with chewing gum is if 
a child is, I know most kids don't chew gum, but if a kid's not eating any tough food, that could actually help stimulate the, the jaw growth as well. So mm. xylitol gum could help them prevent decay as well as, you know, stimulate jaw growth. So they can fit all their teeth in. So the parents don't have to have expensive orthodontics and all, and all that stuff. Interesting. Interesting. Yeah. With these, uh, Invisalign, they give me these little chewies. I'm supposed to sit here and like not on them. Yeah. <laughs> I think it's to like push the Invisalign on harder, but I, I feel like I'm a dog, like doing chew therapy. <laughs> <laughs> oh, too funny. Okay. Well, this has been awesome. We've talked about so much good stuff. Tell people, Kevin, where to find you on social media. Maybe they want to be your patient. I don't know. Tell them where you practice. Um, well, you can find me in just all the regular social media places. I do write a weekend newsletter. That's where I say like for people that like to avoid social media or limit it, that's where I just try to put my best stuff into the Saturday seven newsletter. So then you don't have to follow me anywhere else. Uh, so that's where I would go. Cool. Cool. What's your website? Uh, kevinstock.io. And the I, I run the site Meat Health, which is meat.health. So if you're interested in any of the, the meat-based diet slash carnivore-ish diet. Uh, that's all at meat.health, but it's also on my website too. So I love it. I love it. Okay. You guys eat meat, lift weights, take care of your mouth. <laughs> <laughs> that's the recipe. Yeah, that's it. All right. Well, this has been awesome. Thank you guys for listening. If you enjoyed this episode, make sure you leave us your reviews, especially on Apple podcasts. Make sure you share it with people for everybody over on YouTube. Make sure you subscribe to the channel, like leave your comments and questions, and we'll check you on the next episode.